Welcome to our online pre-recorded service for Sunday, October 18th, 2020. This is offered in addition to our other worship services this weekend. Starting this Sunday, October 18th, we are resuming in-person indoor worship at 9 a.m. You need to pre-register and you can do so at stpfeeds.org. We recognize that not everyone is ready to come back for indoor worship, and so we will continue to live stream that service on Zoom and Facebook. You can join us uh, on those vehicles at 9 a.m., and the links are in our weekly epistle newsletter and also on our website. And that service will also be on YouTube, where this service is uh, later on Sunday. So you have many opportunities to join us for worship in person or uh, virtually. We have a brief uh, worship service uh, each weekday, Monday through Thursday, noonday prayer uh, at 12 noon, and you're welcome to join us for that on Zoom as well. And the links, again, are in the newsletter and on the website. If you're joining us for this service, this will be a weekly brief. We're trying to keep it to about a half an hour. Kind of thinking of this as our 8 o'clock service, and I'm really pleased that our regular 8 o'clock reader, Kathy Smith, is able to be our reader today. Um, a sermon, uh, some prayers, a little bit of music, but we're really trying to keep this uh, to be a short service, and you can access it uh, anytime starting on Saturday uh, through, throughout the week, and it will uh, live on YouTube. There are a number of things coming up. Our stewardship uh, campaign is underway. We just had our Light Up the Night celebration on Friday, and uh, we invite you to participate. You know, every year we have a, a couple of members who give a stewardship witness uh, about uh, their time uh, as a way of motivating people uh, to think about stewardship. But this year, instead of just featuring a couple of people, we're inviting all of you to take part. We'd like you to, if you're willing, take a video of yourself using your cell phone uh, of less than a minute. So you have up to a minute uh, to give something, just something you're grateful for. Could be the beauty of nature, you know, the fall leaves, or it could be something about church, or it could be something about your family. Just something that you're thinking about this year that you're grateful for. Video yourself, or it could be an audio, and email it to me at ericw, E-R-I-C-W, at stpfeeds.org, and information will also be in the newsletter. For now, Sit back, relax, join us for this worship service, and may God bless you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, in Christ you have revealed your glory among the nations. Preserve the works of your mercy, that your church throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in the confession of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Isaiah 45, 1-7 Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains, I will break in pieces the doors of bronze, and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make weal and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. The psalm this morning is Psalm 96. I sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the whole earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations and his wonders among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. 
he is more to be feared than all gods. As for all the gods of the nations, they are but idols. But it is the Lord who made the heavens. O oh, the majesty and magnificence of his presence! O oh, the power and the splendor of his sanctuary! Ascribe to the Lord, you families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord honor and power. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth tremble before him. Tell it out among the nations. The Lord is king. He has made the world so firm that it cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea thunder and all that is in it. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood shout for joy before the Lord when he comes. When he comes to judge the earth, he will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. The epistle this morning is from Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with the truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. 
Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, they're at it again. Jesus' opponents, in this case the Pharisees and the Herodians, interestingly two groups that despised each other and did not get along, but they have now teamed up because each of them has had trouble getting Jesus, and so they have teamed up with the perfect gotcha question. They've been really thinking hard about this, and they've got a foolproof question to stump Jesus and get him in trouble. They ask him, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? So here's the genius of this question. If he says, yes, it's lawful to pay taxes, then he is siding with the Roman Empire, the oppressors who make the lives of the people of Israel miserable, who extort taxes from them and give them no rights. Uh, they are the hated overlords. And so if he sides with them and says yes, then he's in trouble with all of the Jews who have been following him. But if he says, no, it's not lawful, then he's in trouble with, guess who? The Romans, and he can be reported and arrested for treason. This is a perfect question. But as usual, Jesus is more than a match for their malice. He responds by turning the question around on them. Show me the coin, he says, that's used for this tax. And they give him the denarius. It's got a picture of uh, Caesar Augustus on one side and on the other side. It gives his title, ironically, Son of God. He says to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Perfect answer, separation of church and state, all over. Except the more you think about this story, the more you think about what Jesus said, render to God the things that are God's, the more it causes you to think about what that might mean. Is it simply that some things are uh, the states or the emperors and some things are God's? Maybe not. This was the exact question that the prophet Isaiah was asking about six centuries earlier. You see, Isaiah was struggling with the idea uh, during the time of the exile. See, the Babylonians had conquered Israel and they had set all the leaders of the people away. And this was a very dark time. But then, out of nowhere, came a new leader. The Babylonians, this mighty empire, were themselves conquered by an even mightier empire, the Persians. And the Persian Emperor Cyrus had decreed that all those people who had been exiled should be allowed to return home. This was a great deal of joy for the people of Israel and for the prophet Isaiah. This long exile was ending and the leaders were coming home. There was a renewal of the identity of the people back to their home in Israel, a great sign of God's salvation. And so he says, how can it be that a pagan king, Cyrus, has brought about this amazing action of God? And he articulates an idea which had been sort of there along uh, the way, but had never been fully expressed that in fact, this God, Yahweh, this, this national God of the Hebrews, you know, they used to believe that every nation had its own God and their God was Yahweh. And Yahweh only looked out for the Hebrews and he was their sort of tribal God. And just like the Canaanites had their tribal gods, we had ours. But now Isaiah says, no, 
There are no other gods. There is only the one God who made the heavens and the earth, who made everything in them, who made the Persians and the Babylonians and the Hebrews and the Egyptians and even people far off in Rochester, Michigan. There's only one God. And this God has been acting in human history. And it is this God who has inspired this pagan King Cyrus, who's never heard of Yahweh, to restore the people and to bring about God's plan. This idea of God as the one universal God is an incredibly powerful idea that is the expression of Jewish thought in the Old Testament, uh, particularly in the prophet Isaiah and in others. It is this idea of monotheism which sets the stage for our understanding as Christians that no nation can call upon God as their own God. You know, we say God bless America, but we don't mean God only bless America. We believe that God is the creator of the whole world and cares about every human being, the maker of every blade of grass, every mountain, every hill, every ocean, every person, even my crazy dog who was trying to horn in on this recording. And it is this understanding that I think Jesus is offering back to the Herodians and to the Pharisees. When he says, render to God the things that are God's, he's inviting them to take a whole new look at the essence of their faith. Because if God is the God of the whole earth, then what is God's? It is everything. Render to God the things that are God's. Render to God, in other words, everything. And so on this Stewardship Sunday, in the middle of our stewardship campaign, when I make my appeal to you to be generous and to give to the church till it hurts, what I'm really offering you is these words of Jesus and the words of the prophet Isaiah, because it's about way more, I hope you know, than the check that you write to the church. This is about a spiritual journey of understanding, a spiritual journey of moving from an understanding that you know, God is the one who finds me a parking space to the vast idea that we are part of God's whole universal plan from the beginning of creation until the final consummation of the kingdom of God. We are part of that journey, part of that plan, part of that story, and it is our job to wrestle with our own sense of ego. Because, you know, Jesus knew that however fake religious the Herodians were, and however truly religious but misguided the Pharisees were, that there was a deeper spiritual message that he had come to bring people, that God is always about more. God is always about inviting everyone to the table. God is always about turning over ourselves and wrestling with our egos and allowing God to transform us from the inside. So as you think about stewardship this fall, and whatever your gift to the church, I want to say thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your continued generosity. I've been just blown away by the generosity of people during this pandemic when we've been physically separated. Uh, your giving has made uh, this church continue to go. We've been able to accomplish it incredible things, even in the midst of this pandemic, so thank you. But I want you to see stewardship as about more than that. It's about turning your life over to God. It's about inviting God to use you in that grand work that God is doing, the healing of this creation and the uh, accomplishing of the kingdom of God. That, that's that's what it means to render to God the things that are God. Your life, your intelligence, your experience, your energy, your activity, your stuff, all of it is to be turned over to God in order for God to work with it. Now, the great news is that God allows you to keep it. It's not that God has a big storehouse where he wants to put your 
your, uh, your car and your bicycle and everything else. It's that God wants you to use everything that you have for God's own glory, for the accomplishing of his great purpose of love and the kingdom of God. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for all for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For, for all, all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For the Church, especially Michael, our presiding bishop, Bonnie, our bishop, Wendell and Stuart, our retired bishops, Eric, Anne and John, our priests, Brianne in her year of discernment at the EYSJ, for Moises, Bishop of the Diocese of the Dominican Republic, for Lutheran bishops, Elizabeth, Donald, and Craig, for our diocesan household, remembering especially all saints in Pontiac, St. Michael's in Lansing, St. Barnabas in Chelsea, and in the Dominican Republic, St. Luke's in Santiago. Together, may we help others come to know him. For all who serve in his church. For those in places of leadership and authority. For Donald, our president, Gretchen, our governor, that they may live and act in the grace of Jesus and the love of God. For all who work or live in places of violence, injustice, and oppression. For first responders, for all the men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad, especially remembering Ryan, Trace, Stephanie, Dylan, Matthew, Ian, and Dan and all those who work for peace, that God will turn the hearts of the oppressors and open pathways that will lead to reconciliation and peace. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. For the, for the special, special needs. needs, for the special needs of this congregation, remembering especially Carol, Anne, David and Karen, Frank and B, Catherine, Gregory, George, Jason and Chelsea, Ian, Karen, Rob and Sue, Char, Mary Ann, Jim, Margaret, Todd, Alina, Janet, John, Liz, Jan and Leo, Leo, Lee and Betty, Alex. Jane, Jim, Brenda, Megan, Becky, Henry, Rick, Anne, James, Connie, Sean, Rich, Janice, Sylvia, Susan, Ray, Lois, Wendy, and Jane. Are there others? And hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King and praise your name forever and ever.
We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. We pray for all those celebrating birthdays this month, in particular, Dave Borgard, Merv Grobel, Rebecca Kubik, Jim Lauder, Megan Lindley, Heather Molly. Malatoris Gregor, Tammy Sand, Tobias Shirley, Elizabeth West, Ian Zadral, and Jill Zadral. If you are celebrating a birthday and are not on this list, uh, let us know by calling the office so we can add you. And now let's pray for those and anyone who is celebrating a birthday this week or this month. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we give thanks for those celebrating anniversaries. Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of life and love, bless those whom you have joined in holy matrimony. Grant them wisdom and devotion in the ordering of their lives together, that each may be to the other a strength in need, a counselor in perplexity, a comfort in sorrow, and a companion in joy. And so knit their wills together in your will, and their spirits in your spirit, that they may show forth your love and abide in your peace all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Oh. 
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.